Welcome everyone to the Aspetuck Land Trust Lunch and Learn series. My name is Jean Stetspachowski and I'm the moderator for today's program. We are so honored to have and to have uh, Anna Fialco joining us today. Welcome Anna. Um, Anna is the Ecological Programs Manager of the Wild Seed Project in Maine and is just so exciting to have you here. So before we get started, just wanna let everybody know how we're utilizing Zoom today so we can have a seamless webinar experience. We are a webinar today, so we will, uh, we will not be able to see you. We would like to communicate with you via chat and Q&A. So if you go to the bottom of your screen with your cursor, you can move right along the bottom and you'll see the Q&A box and the chat. We'll be curating all of the questions at the end. So throughout the program, feel free to pop questions in uh, for Anna as we go and uh, we will we will take all the questions at, at the end. So this program will be recorded as well. Wanted to let everybody know that. You probably heard that as you were coming on into the program today. So we're gonna go ahead and get started, but before we move into program mode, we're gonna kick this off with a three minute video that explains the Aspetuck Land Trust Green Corridor Initiative. So sit back and enjoy and watch the video. Keep in, as you're watching, keep in mind how everything you do in your yard has an impact on the broader connected landscape. So I'll turn this over to Mel to start our video and sit back and enjoy. So we'll be queuing up the volume in just a moment, but I in, would invite you to just look at the incredibly visually stunning images on your screen, uh, probably familiar to so many. You're seeing uh, the great blueberry fields and uh, Vaspatuck Land Trust and um, many, familiar to many here. So give us a minute as we navigate our, uh, our video today. And so what we might do if we're having difficult, difficulty with the video is just, okay. is just gonna, move. Hmm? Yeah, we were just, I just had to uh, unmute. Hopefully you oh. can hear me now. Sorry about that. I had a hidden mute button. Here it is. Thanks so much, Mel. Here we are. Imagine okay. a Fairfield County where the beauty of our land is preserved, where birds and insects flourish and natural species thrive where people have more preserved lands to enjoy, drinking water is pure, and flooding is diminished. Here at Aspetuck Land Trust, we are making this happen and encouraging others to support our Green Corridor mission. Part one of the Green Corridor is protecting land. We are preserving strategically located land parcels in our six town region by either purchasing them or receiving them as donations. So far, this includes 42 parcels and over 800 acres of land. Among those are Gilberti's Farm and the Fromson Strassler property in Weston, where we are creating a 705 acre forest block on the Weston Wilton border. Part two of the Green Corridor is land stewardship, encouraging homeowners to keep their backyards sustainable. We are controlling the plants that are on our land. And right now we, we vastly favor giant lawns. We've got 40 million acres of lawn in this country. That's the size of New England. Uh, and, and particularly the way we treat our lawns, that's, it's a deadscape. Our lawns don't provide food webs that support all the other things that we, we need. So what we wanna do is re-landscape our yards. I suggest we cut the area of lawn in half, put in the plants that support the food webs and the pollinators and create uh, what we, we call biological carters that connect the actual habitats so that the plants and animals in those habitats not only can move back and forth between habitats, uh, but they can actually live outside those habitats. Now, the Green Corridor Initiative from Aspetuck Land Trust uh, is organizing an effort to create the biological carters that, that we talked about. Of course, the carter will be much more effective if everybody joins up. If you have holes in it, that's you know, that's an obstruction. And it, you know, it's not hard. Put that oak tree in your yard. 
and, and instead of the ginkgo. And all of a sudden you've got connectivity with, with migrating birds and countless other species. We are in a critical moment in time to save our species and protect our natural lands. Insect populations have declined by 40% since the 1970s, and we've lost 3 billion birds since that time. And as population growth swells in America's suburbs, so does harmful development. Creating a greener planet starts with greener suburbs and greener backyards. Thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful video. I'd like to introduce our executive director of Aspatuck Land Trust, David Brandt, to welcome all of you and share the vision of the connected landscape that we call the Green Corridor and how Anna Fialco's lecture today is perfectly aligned to the Aspatuck Land Trust mission. So welcome, David. Thanks, Jean. Uh, and thank you so much, Anna, for um, coming today and giving this great talk. Uh, I'm certainly excited to hear you speak. Um, your subject, uh, Native Plant Guilds, is super relevant, as Jean said, for our Green Corridor Initiative, uh, which is, as you see you know, from the video, it's really Aspetuck Land Trust's big vision for the landscape, and we are making it happen. Uh, on the land protection front, um, we've preserved, uh, we're already preserving lands as part of our Green Corridor vision. Um, and on the homeowner engagement front that Mel, Mary Ellen LeMay is leading uh, to try and build our biodiversity snowball by getting thousands of homeowners to rethink how they take care of their yard uh, with an eye towards you know, building biodiversity. So this doesn't happen without people. Uh, I always say land doesn't preserve itself, people preserve land. And we can't do this work without support, financial support from our members. We have nearly 1,700 of them, which is amazing. Um, so I want to thank all of the members that are on the, the Zoom today. And if you're not a member, uh, please join. Um, what we're doing as a land trust um, is building a national model for how we can engage homeowners to build biodiversity in the landscape. Homeowners are the connective tissue uh, between our protected open spaces, and we just can't protect every single open space you know, in our region. Uh, or even in the Green Corridor. So it's really vitally important uh, uh, that we continue to do this work with the homeowners to build more biodiversity in the landscape. So um, it's, it's groundbreaking work for land trust and we think we're creating a national model on this front. And Mel is leading the charge and people like Anna who are talking about these really important things. Um, so, you know, I just wanna thank you again for being here, um, for being a part of this effort, you know, I think what I'll leave you with is, you know, land conservation work, it doesn't just happen on open spaces in the woods, um, which is traditionally the role of that land trusts play in protecting these open spaces out somewhere that people can drive to. I mean, it happens in our cities, it happens in our backyards, uh, but it also really first has to happen in our minds with the realization uh, that the land sustains us all. We are all part of this food web and what we do literally can change the world um, if enough people do it. So I just wanna thank you for, for coming and thank you again um, for all you're doing. And I'll introduce you to Mary Ellen LeMay, who is our Director of Landowner Engagement, who's doing groundbreaking work to excite and delight many homeowners uh, to get involved in this work um, and who put this uh, Zoom together today. Um, thanks for listening and thank you, Mel. Thank you, David. Thanks for that, that eloquent speech. And, and you know, this is truly a groundbreaking um, initiative with the Green Corridor. There's no other land trusts that are doing this, at least in, in Connecticut that we know of. Um, and I, I uh, am a main um, resident for uh, part of the year. And uh, I see the great things that the, um, and Maine is doing in the Wild Seed Project in particular. Um, so thank you, David, for that. And um, I wanted to thank Jean uh, Stets Pachalski for those of you who get on our Lunch and Learns regularly. Jean is the velvet voice that um, keeps us all calm and focused. And she's an Aspetuck Land Trust volunteer. Um, 
And I want to give her a special uh, shout out. Um, she's the principal of Individual Differences at Work, which is a leadership and coaching company. She cultivates leaders who grow organizations um, and is a longtime member and supporter of the Aspetuck Land Trust. So thank you, Jean, for your calm hand. And also uh, thank Shana Meyer, who is our um, manager of data and marketing, who uh, is also in the background so many times um, controlling uh, everything. She's like a, a ground zero or Houston in terms of managing our technology. So thanks very much. So um, I would like to, first of all, welcome everybody today. This is one of our biggest lunch and learns ever. And um, it, it, it's quite remarkable uh, how many people are on board today to, to watch uh, Anna's um, lecture. Um, and thank you for joining us. It's a real treat to have you here today. Um, as I briefly mentioned, I've been involved in the Wild Seed Project in Maine for a number of years. And I've always looked to them and their founder, Heather McCargo as a source of important and approachable information on native plants and the critical role in improving biodiversity in the landscape at multiple scales. The recent book, um, Native Trees of the Northeast Landscape, which I never have too far from me and it is very dog-eared, um, uh, was written by Heather and by Anna. Um, and it's been my go-to book for selecting keystone species of native trees for our Aspetuck Land Trust sale and for my own yard as well. The Wild Seed Project is now launching a new booklet on native ground covers for the Northeast landscape that will be an informational guide for all of our Aspetuck members down here in Connecticut, as well as the rest of the Northeast. I'm so thankful to Anna, Heather and the Wild Seed team for being the standard bearers for native plant inspiration at a time when it is most needed. We have over 17 states on this call, on this Zoom call today and folks from Canada. So welcome everybody. Uh, and it's just very heartwarming to know that this concept of introducing natives into our landscape is spreading uh, nationwide. Um, a little bit about Anna before she shares her screen with us. Um, she is the uh, ecological programs manager for the Wild Seed uh, project. Um, she furthers the organization's educational mission to inspire people to return natives to the main landscape and works in partners to dem with partners to demonstrate rewilding in action. Anna was most recently the senior horticulturist at the Native Plant Trust Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts, where she designed and installed native plant gardens managed interns and volunteers and taught community members ways to incorporate native plants in their own gardens. With a BA in human ecology from the College of the Atlantic and an MS in ecological design from the Conway School, uh, she brings with her a deep knowledge of native plant ecology, horticulture, conservation and ecological landscape design. I am delighted today uh, for Lunch and Learn to join Anna Falcock. So you can share your screen and, and beginning, begin sharing your pearls of wisdom with us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen. Oops, here we go. <laughs> um, I really appreciate um, the frame that you put everything in this morning and introducing um, the Aspetuck Land Trust and the Greenbelt Initiative. I think that's a really awesome model for um, creating connected habitats um, in our landscapes. And um, I am excited to chat with you all today about some of the work that we do at Wild Seed Project and give you an idea of, um, you know, how to think about um, putting native plants in your landscape in a way that's, that they're going to function optimally, as well as the, a way that they're going to look beautiful together. I think one of the most difficult things that people find is when they start learning about native plants, there's just so much information and so much to learn. Um, and it can be a really overwhelming when you go to pick out plants from the nursery to think about, you know, what is the best species to pick? What species work well together? Um, how do I arrange them in my landscape? So I think that kind of design question um, is often the lingering question for folks who don't have that background and don't shouldn't need to have that background to put native plants into their landscapes. Um, so I think thinking about 
native plants in combinations or beautiful groups of plants can really help um, take away some of that daunting feeling when you go to pick out your plants from the nursery. It should be lots of fun. Um, so just also a little bit more about Wild Seed Project before we get started. Some of you may not be familiar with us. We are a small nonprofit, but growing in Southern Maine. And we actually, um, like Mary Ellen said, we're, we, um, our mission is to inspire people to take action, to put natives into their landscapes and you know, support biodiversity and reduce habitat loss and adapt to an ever-changing climate. Um, we also sell seeds of native plants and um, that is a great way to, for people to put more native species into their landscapes, grow their own species so that they feel empowered um, in that way where it doesn't have to be done for them. And it's a really cost effective way to grow, you know, to have plants in your landscape. It puts more plants back into the landscape. So I encourage everyone to check out our website to see what seeds we have available for spring. Um, but we also have this rewilding initiative, the pledge to rewild. Um, and that's basically taking a holistic view of um, native plant design and, and, and yard gardening. Um, it's really thinking about all the different pieces that go with adding native plants to your landscape, including um, different management project practices that you can employ that are going to be um, more beneficial for supporting the full life cycles of the creatures that native plants support. And then also joining forces with your neighbors, joining forces with your community in order to spread the message and create those connected patches of habitat. So um, I wanna just start off by asking everyone if you um, have any sort of association with the word guild, or you have learned about a definition for the word guild, will you write that in the chat box or the Q&A box? I'd really love to hear um, what some of you think of as guilds. And I'll take a minute to wait for everybody to start typing some things in. What is a guild? Guild the lily, <laughs> quilt guild, plants that go together, group of plants, um, Let's see, lots of these are coming in fast. A club, a group of plants that help each other, association of craftsmen, group of people with similar interests or professions, a specialized group, artisan group, common interest. Medieval his studying med medieval history. That's interesting. <laughs> um, yes. A permaculture concept, work and support each other. A knitting guild in Maine. <laughs> a group of plants that grow well together and help each other out um, that, that might enrich the soil, et cetera. Where experts train novices. Okay, association or collective highly skilled or specialized members of a group. So yeah, I think that, you know, those are all really positive um, associations that we have with the word guild. And I think that's to my first point is that, you know, um, I think when I started learning about native plants, I was coming kind of from a design perspective, going to the Conway School of Landscape Design. And we always um, talked about whenever we created a list of plants for a particular site. It was called a plant palette. Um, and I've used that word a lot, but I've since kind of realized that that word might not be the best way to describe a group of plants that work well together because um, though it's a nice word, it really makes me think of a painter's palette and it's really designery kind of word. Um, it's a painter's palette is really looking at all just the aesthetics of the plants that work together, the colors and the textures and everything, the time of year that they bloom. But there's so much more to thinking about how we group plants together. So that's why I think the word guild makes a lot of sense. It's actually um, a word that's, it's an ecological word. Um, it's been used for um, 
many years in the ecological community where um, you're looking at a group of plants that um, are all maybe tolerant of the same types of soil and light conditions and grow together. Um, and that might be thought of as a plant community as well. So um, I want to kind of point you to what I think of as the original guild. Um, so the three sisters, many of you might be familiar with, that's corn, beans, and squash. And it's actually uh, something that's been employed by many Native American tribes, um, growing plants in three sisters, um, in the three sisters, you know, group. Um, the Iroquois were well known for doing this, and it's actually has a lot of, uh, you know, really important um, symbolism within it as well. And it's, you know, it's part of uh, the Iroquois creation story. Um, when Sky Women fell, her, her daughter that was born gave birth to the three sisters and then she since died, but um, the three sisters um, created corn, beans, and squash. And so that's a really, it's a really significant food source for um, the Native American tribes in the New York and Pennsylvania area. Um, and it is interesting to think about these plants. Um, they're not considered part of the native plant, uh, uh, you know, palette right now, but uh, they were here pre-European colonization. So one could argue that these plants are native um, to the Northeast. But in any case, we're not going to, you know, go into that too much today. But um, these plants work together in the landscape in in that, you know, in these mounds of corn, beans, and squash, the corn is kind of the pole for the beans to climb up. The beans fix nitrogen in the soil, adding nutrients and organic matter back to the soil as they die back as well. And then the um, squash is kind of like a living mulch, really, uh, that's broad leaves sprawl out and shade out the, um, the ground below, also kind of suppressing weeds and retaining soil moisture. Uh, when their leaves die back, they add organic matter to the soil as well, and they all produce something edible. Now, since um, Native Americans have been using the Three Sisters, um, the um, permacultural community has definitely adopted the term guilds and um, talked about using, you know, productive and often edible plants um, in combinations, kind of like the Three Sisters. Um, and that and you know kind of reuse that term that was more of an ecological term in the past. Um, now guilds when I the guilds that I'm going to talk about today don't necessarily have to be uh, you know um, productive of food, but they're productive in another way. They're productive for our ecological food webs. Um, when I worked at Garden in the Woods as a horticulturist, many of the horticulturists um, came together and we decided it would be really fun to think about kind of a native plant alternative to the three sisters or, and so we, we thought of what plants would work together in this, in a similar way to the three sisters. And that's, we came up with the three brothers. So this isn't uh, a true um, guild that was used by um, Native American tribes in the Northeast, but these are all plants that are native to the Northeast. Um, sunchokes are um, a beautiful tall, true sunflower and they um, bloom in September. They have an underground tuber that's actually pretty starchy and full of a lot of nutrition. And th that can be cooked um, and made into uh, pureed soups or roasted and made into artichoke or Jerusalem artichoke chips. Um, they're really tasty. To some people, they do cause some gastrointestinal um, discomfort. So I would definitely um, try eating sunchoke in small quantities before you really go all in. Um, and I would do that with any um, edible plant that you haven't eaten before. Just try a little bit first. Uh, wild strawberry is, of course, edible. It grows along the ground as a ground cover and sprawls through its stolons, which are un above ground stems that um, they basically spider out and form new baby plants. And then those plants actually take root in the ground. And so they'll form kind of a knitted patchwork of a uh, ground cover over time. Um, then American groundnut is actually a perennial vine 
so it dies back each year, but it grows up, you know, other taller plants, like it would grow up sunchoke very nicely and is also in the pea family. So it would fix nitrogen in the soil. Um, it has these amazingly beautiful flowers that go unnoticed a lot of the time, but they're actually quite showy and they're fragrant. And it kind of resembles the invasive species called crown vetch to some extent, but I think it's, a, it's even more beautiful and a slightly different color. It's a little bit more of a maroon pink rather than the kind of lavender purple of crown vetch. But it also has an underground tuber that is edible. Um, so I could see these three species working well together, similarly to the three sisters, though not necessarily the complete food source that the three sisters provides. Now, in general, when thinking about the native plant palette, we're not always going to be thinking about edible species, of course. Um, but, you know, another, you know, concept from permaculture is edible forest gardens. And I really like thinking about um, kind of a forested setting to show all the different layers of the landscape and the plants that work well together. Um, New England is uh, primarily you know, meant to be a forested place. We do have lots of um, open meadow areas or grasslands that um, along the coast have been kept open through disturbance like burning a fire. Um, and otherwise, many of our landscapes uh, go through succession and, and kind of tend toward, towards forest. And I think forests um, actually are just as uh, supportive of pollinators and other wildlife as much as open meadow gardens that have lots of flowers for pollinators because they have a lot of the host plants for pollinators, a lot of the oaks and maples, um, beaches and poplars and other things in the upper story in the canopy um, are actually host plants to moth and butterfly caterpillars. And those in turn feed birds, um, especially birds that are feeding their young in spring rely on a, a diet of um, mostly caterpillars. So it's really important to think about those caterpillar factories as um, host plants for pollinators just as much as the flowering plants that grow in open areas. So, um, I think, you know, thinking about our guilds at, with a, the kind of forest inspired thinking is a really good, good way to go about it. You have your canopy plants, um, your canopy trees, and then underneath that you can have medium sized trees and small trees and uh, one of the small trees in this um, image is the flowering dogwood. It's got these beautiful big bracted flowers which are actually most of the, the flower is not a true flower, but the inner kind of center of the flower is the actual flower that attracts um, insects. The big white um, petal-like structures are actually leaves or adapted um, leaves to look like flower petals to attract those um, species in, but they're also beautiful, beautiful for us to look at. And they make the flower look like they last a lot longer because they hang on even after the flower has gone by. Um, and then they give way to a beautiful um, and edible, edible for wildlife, um, red berry that lasts long into the fall. The pink shell azaleas and the understory here and the shrubs and the trees really form kind of the scaffolding of our landscapes, the structure by which everything else can kind of be laid in. So I think it's great to start with planting your trees and shrubs first and I agree, like picking up the book Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes is a great way to um, start putting in that structure using keystone plants, which are the species that support the most moth and butterfly caterpillars. And I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a little bit. Um, then in the understory, we have, you know, taller perennials, um, the, the ferns, the grasses, and then the ground covers uh, that like mayapple here, which really cover up the ground and make sure that the soil moisture is retained and weeds are not kind of coming up and taking their place, so those opportunistic plants. Um, and then they're dying back and adding organic matter to the, to the soil. So mayapple is a really nice example of a ground cover. It's a ground cover for the first half of the growing season, but it's a great idea to interplant mayapple with something else that can take this its space later in the season. So that's one more aspect to thinking about 
combining species. So if you know that one plant really takes main stage in the first part of the season, always combine with another plant that um, really shows up and fills out that space later in the season. So I really like pairing May apple with things like Pennsylvania sedge, ferns, and other longer lived wildflowers that um, after the May apple dies back by midsummer, something's there to take its place. So when you're thinking about creating your guild, there are certain things that you always want to check off that you, you know, you do when you're creating your guild. So you want to first always start by assessing your site conditions. So the light and the soil are really important to know um, what kinds of light conditions you have. The is it sunny or is it part shade or is it full shade? Is the soil moisture, you know, wet and boggy most of the time, or is it kind of average, it's, it's sort of moist, but it doesn't, you know, get super dry or does it stay dry all the time? And what are the, what types of soil do you have? I'm not going to go into how to assess your site now, but you're welcome to ask some more questions about that in, as a follow-up to the presentation later. Um, and then you want to fill all those vertical layers like a forest in your landscape. And so maybe you don't have enough room for all your the canopy trees um, or even a small tree. You could still have um, layered plantings, even in open sunny spaces with perennials. So if you have a taller perennial like a New England aster, you can pair with it other plants that grow underneath it and around it because a lot of times our taller perennials are a little bit leggy. And if you zoom down and looked at kind of the soil level, there's actually um, often nothing really growing there except for potentially weeds. So if you put in a ground cover underneath that New England aster, then you're going to have still a nice layered um, planting. Um, but your layers can include other things like um, like vines that grow and fill up that vertical space. Like in this photo, we have coral honeysuckle in the top left corner. It could be small shrubs that can be trained like trees, like limbed up so that they can accommodate more layers underneath them. Um, and it can happen in a variety of ways. We also wanna think about grouping plants with similar growth rates. So say you have Canada anemone in your backyard, you wanna have other just as aggressive plants or vigorous plants in your backyard to compete with it or else the Canada anemone is going to kind of take over. So I wouldn't put you know, a trillium species with Canada anemone for instance, but I might put something like big leaf aster because that is also a nice competitive species. And you can plan for seasonal interest. And I think many of us have heard this with uh, different garden design classes, but I'm also talking about seasonal interest for wildlife, not just for people. So of course we wanna have an array of colors and blooms and textures and, and berries for us to be able to observe throughout the growing season and into the winter, but we also want those things for wildlife. So we wanna have pollinator opportunities at all times during the growing season, especially thinking about those early times and then the very end of the season when oftentimes those um, species are most in need of pollinator opportunities. Um, we also want to have, you know, berries that hold, hold on through the winter or um, seed heads, not cut our gardens back down to the ground necessarily um, each year so that we have something to offer wildlife throughout the seasons. And then we want to think about, of course, the, the visual and aesthetic sides of, side of it all. If our gardens look beautiful, then we're going to more likely have other people want to repeat what we're doing and emulate it. So we really need to you know, you know, think about our native plants gardens as not just um, the more wild woolly landscapes, but also as beautifully intentionally designed landscapes. And so having a variety of complementary textures and colors um, in your planting is going to make it more visually appealing and more readable for the average person. So just a note for seasonal interest, this is something that I found to be really helpful um, when I um, am planning a new planting. I like to put together 
um, a spreadsheet for, you know, various types of things. And I'm a spreadsheet thinker and I know not everybody is. So maybe you'll find a method that works better for you. But I really like to make sure that the season is covered. So I look at what is interesting about the plant or what's going to be offered to wildlife at different times of the year. And then I can put all my plants in the list together and be able to kind of see that, that it's um, equally spread throughout the year distributed so that I'm not having any holes or gaps in when something is available for wildlife or something is, is beautiful to look at. So now I want to kind of go in and just talk about the plants. And I'm gonna go through six different types of conditions that you could have, hopefully covering every situation you might have um, and give you a, a brief list of what could work for these different situations. Now, these lists are not gonna be comprehensive. There's always more plants you could add and feel free to substitute and add plants as you wish. But I really like the idea of having kind of a smaller list to work with to start so that you don't get too bogged down or overwhelmed by the choices. So for sunny and dry conditions, um, I have a couple canopy trees, a couple medium trees, small trees, three shrubs, and then several ground layer plants. And some of those are true ground covers, really covering the ground and sprawling out through rhizomes or under or above ground stolons, or sometimes that seed around. Um, but a lot of, but the general idea with the ground layer is that it's really taking up space on the ground underneath those other taller layers. Um, and they, those can be paired together for seasonality as well. Um, I really love uh, many of the species in here, and I want to talk about, you know, a few species for each of these different conditions. So for a sunny, dry place, um, one of my top picks for a small tree would be the beech plum. Beech plums are actually, you know, in their natural habitat, they grow in coastal sand plains. So they grow out of sometimes pure sand dunes. Um, very well-drained dry soil that is um, also, you know, potentially going to receive salt spray and salt in the soil. So they're extremely salt tolerant plants, very tough plants for tough conditions. And they normally are naturally grow as kind of sprawling and suckering um, shrubs that kind of form beautiful dense thickets that can be really important for creating cover for birds and of course offering forage throughout the year for pollinators with their flowers and then um, beech plums, the plums themselves for, for different species with their, their fruit that comes in the later summer. Now these plums are actually really tasty. They're, they taste exactly like a regular plum. They're just a lot smaller. They're about the size of a large cherry and they're a pitted fruit of course. Um, and this is just a remarkable tree for um, a variety of, of different kinds of situations, but I really like the idea of it as a roadside plant or, you know, something to grow along your driveway or the sidewalk or a street tree um, that won't interrupt the power lines above it because it's nice and short. And you can maintain it as a beautiful, charming tree instead of a rambling shrub. If you start with a, a young whip, just a, a single stemmed small seedling. And then as it grows, um, you can kind of each year take out some of the lower um, stems that have a, that are a lot very leafy, that have a lot of kind of twiggy leafy branches on them. And then eventually it'll get up to about six to eight feet tall. And you can um, prune it up so that most of those twiggy leafy branches are above eye level. And it can still be kind of a multi-stemmed tree. It can have, you know, three, even five stems, but if it's pruned up a little bit higher, it resembles more of a charming small tree. And it's um, actually easier to stack and layer more vegetation underneath it, getting more diversity into your planting. Um, now, bayberry is a fantastic, shrub that's kind of semi evergreen. This grows in sunny dry sites, but is also very versatile and will grow in part shade and uh, wetter soils too. Um, so this one, I wouldn't just, you know, limit to dry sites. It's uh, kind of semi evergreen, as I said. So that means that, you know, the leaves hang on for a good portion of the winter, but 
they will usually fall off by kind of late winter. And um, then you'll be left with the, um, the ling lingering waxy fruit, which is uh, coveted by birds and is really needed by birds kind of later winter into early spring when it's often a time of famine for birds and other wildlife. I often see cedar wax, wax wings all over these plants in late winter. And the plant itself is fragrant. It's a really beautiful fragrance, kind of like I like to call spicy bubble gum. Um, when you just rake the leaves with your hand, it smells great and the berries themselves as well. And this waxy coating on the berries has actually in the past been used to create candles. So I actually knew someone who um, boiled down a whole bunch of bayberry uh, berries and made um, uh, you know, enough wax for about like a can's worth of wax, a small can, and it takes a lot of berries to do that. So I would probably leave them for the birds instead, but you could mix that, you know, the wax that you make from bayberry in with, you know, some beeswax so that it stretches a little farther and it smells incredible. Um, it's a really nice seasonal gift for somebody. But also bayberry, since it you know, loses its leaves a little later in the winter um, and holds on to them through the fall. It often actually is a little bit later to leaf out in spring. So that's something to keep in mind. It'll be bare a little bit longer than other shrubs, but that's okay. You can pair it with other species um, so that you have a really nice array of different types of um, leaves and, and berries and fruits together. And I really like the idea of using this as kind of an informal hedge along a street. Um, a screening hedge is great because of its dense and almost evergreen foliage. Um, and it also is very tolerant of salt. So it grows in the coastal sand plain as well, like beach plum. And so this is kind of where I like to, you know, bring in the point that um, it's important to think about using plants for specific conditions or specific types of sites that are kind of analogous to what you would use them in in a built landscape. So um, for instance, the coastal plain is a really great um, analogous habitat for an urban landscape because of the extra presence of salt on the roads and um, oftentimes very dry uh, conditions or there can be kind of a combination of being inundated for periods of time and then being very dry for periods of time and having to tolerate heat and drought. Um, so I really like, you know, looking to the coastal sand plain plant palette or plant community in order to um, gain inspiration for what plants I'd use in urban areas. Another example for um, herbaceous plants would be something like a group of plants like um, plantain leaf pussy toes, um, orange mil butterfly milkweed, and flax leaf stiff aster. Now you could pair all the plants I just mentioned together, um, the beach plum, the bayberry, and then these three species and have a really nice guild or, or palette of plants that work really well for the right, the same conditions. Um, and here's kind of another take on what could be in the ground layer uh, for really tough spots like parking lots, hill strips, rock walls, places where there's kind of the radiant heat coming off of a, a stone or pavement and that are going to grow out of very poor, thin soils, um, very well-drained soils is important for all these species. This is actually one of the ground cover guilds that we illustrate in our new upcoming ground, native ground covers for Northeast Landscapes guide. So you're going to get to see a number of the guilds that we illustrate in the guide and see kind of a preview of what some of the content in our guide looks like. At the very end of the presentation, I'll show you what the cover of the guide looks like too. So these three species would work really well together. The flax-leaved aster, um, three-toothed sink foil, which is kind of a mouthful to say, and, and plantain leaf pussy toes. Now, I also think that their, the textures of their leaves and the colors of their leaves go really well together. So you have the fuzzy leaves of the pussy toes. It's a really nice sprawling plant that's not too fast growing. It's uh, kind of slow to moderate. Same with the three-toothed 
sink foil that has a glossy leaf and um, it's in the rose family. So it has very similar flowers to roses. Um, but this plant has, you know, a similar kind of sprawling habit, um, but they would kind of mix in nicely together. And I think both of these species would get overwhelmed um, by other plants in richer soils or with taller plants around them. So that's partly why they go really well together. And the flax leaf stiff aster is a nice petite upright plant with kind of stiff foliage, like waxy feeling foliage that and very narrow leaves. So I think that complements the broader leaves of the other two species. Um, this is another guild or ground cover guild that we've come up with for our ground cover guide. And this is looking at, you know, some of the same conditions as we've been talking about, but thinking about a different type of site. So for a guild that repairs and rebuilds soil after, um, say, invasive species have been removed or after construction, after the soil has been degraded, this is a really great group of plants. Um, partridge pea is actually a native annual that will seed around and fill in bare soil when, especially at the beginning of a planting, before the plants have really begun to fill in all the different spaces in the soil. And it's actually used a lot in ecological restorations or in meadow um, establishment because of this, because it, it will seed around and be very uh, prolific in the first several years of the planting, but once the longer lived perennials and grasses start to grow in, it will kind of peter out as there's less and less exposed soil. Um, and so it serves that really great function in helping establish a planting while kind of suppressing weeds, uh, fixing nitrogen in the soil, and creating tons of um, pollinator activity as it's blooming in midsummer. So its flowers have pollen in them and they attract tons of different beneficial insects, but it also has these little extra floral nectaries at the base of its leaves that are these little cups filled with nectar. And they serve, serve no purpose in reproduction for the plant. They're there to attract beneficial insects like ants that could help protect the plant from being predated um, or attract just other species so that they drink the extra floral nectaries and then find the flowers and will pollinate the flowers. So beetles, bees, wasps, um, moths and butterflies and ants are all attracted to this species. It's a, a real um, pollinator magnet. Then we have wild strawberry, which is a fast um, establishing ground cover also that um, spreads by stolons kind of like um, I mentioned before, it'll kind of knit together in the landscape and form an impenetrable carpet um, and produce fruits for us to eat as well, though I wouldn't eat them if they were kind of along a roadside or something like that in a really tough place where there could be pollution. Um, the aromatic sumac is in here as a representative of a suckering shrub. This is a great species that the leaves actually at first glance look a lot like poison ivy. And especially, you know, they're three parted and they when they first come out, they're kind of reddish, but they're a little bit more fuzzy to the touch. And when the new leaves actually have a little bit of a fragrance, they're not poisonous at all, like poison ivy is. Um, but this plant grows to be, you know, eight to eight or so feet tall. Um, and you'll often see uh, the cultivar in a lot of suburban areas and urban areas right now in plantings along sidewalks because it doesn't grow more than maybe six to 12 inches tall. But the natural species does grow a good six to eight feet tall or so. Um, and it has a really amazing fall foliage. Pearly everlasting is another um, plant that's quite vigorous. And so all these plants in here are really vigorous and will really take up space. And it has flowers that last through um, midsummer through, you know, the fall, because as the flowers go by, um, they actually still look like flowers, even though they're turning to seed heads. And they're nice and papery and pearly looking. The whole plant is nice and fuzzy, and it'll form a really thick, dense colony. So I really love this group of plants together, and I think they would work really well in the landscape. And another way to look at these is they could be, um, you know, in a, say, a parking lot island or something like that, if they're confined by concrete or by um, 
a, a really solid edge. They won't, you know, get out of control and, and expand into larger areas. So that's one way to treat them. I wouldn't put these in a smaller garden just because um, they are very vigorous and would probably take over other species. So getting into the next condition, sunny with medium moisture in the soil, um, they, this is probably the easiest niche, niche for people to fill because it's, you know, got the most plants that can fit in it. And I think the only thing about this one too is it's one of the, the niches that um, can be the weediest. So you do need species in sunny medium soils or sunny wet soils that can compete against the more vigorous plants are the bit more vigorous weeds. Um, so we'll talk about, you know, some canopy trees, some regular trees, some shrubs and ground layers in this guild. And with these lists also, I'd like to say that, you know, you can mix and match from these species. So as long as you have about three to five species in your guild, I think that's a really nice way to start. So you could have maybe two ground covers or three, a shrub, a tree, and then you'd have a really nice set of plants to work in a particular spot. Um, so you don't have to choose all these plants, but you can you can add in all these plants and um, create more diversity that way. Or you can pick just you know up to seven, but I'd say like three to five species is a great um, amount to group together. And when we're planting, I really think it's good to start with the trees. Um, the trees are, like I mentioned before, the scaffolding for your, and the bones and structure for your planting. And then you can kind of base everything around and underneath them. And I especially think it's great to focus on keystone trees. So black cherry is one of those plants that would be considered a keystone species. Um, the keystone trees are really, there's like a group of five to six trees that are just incredible species that host the most um, moth and butterfly caterpillars. So, you know, the oaks are the top. They host up to 500, depending on where you live. The cherries are also in the hundreds. Willows, poplars, which are, you know, the quaking aspens, big tooth aspen, birches, and, um, as well as some maple species also are up there. And forgive me if I forgot one of them, I was listing them without reading anything. Um, but the black cherry is an underappreciated tree. Um, it does grow in kind of a climax forest as a canopy tree, but you'll often see it growing in kind of waste places and um, edges of the woodlands and, you know, just to, like the seedlings pop up, a you know, in a lot of places. And I would advocate to leave those if you see, see them pop up because they're supporting hundreds of species of moths and butterflies. And so one that I'd like to zero in on is the Cecropia um, moth. I was, uh, when I was a horticulturist at Garden in the Woods, I had the pleasure of being able to raise moth and butterflies. So um, the Cecropia was one of my favorites because it's probably our largest moth and it actually is a, considered a giant silk moth. It's the size of a small bird um, when it's in its adult winged stage. Um, but you most likely won't see it in the landscape because um, its caterpillars are either up in the trees, its cocoons are camouflaged, um, hanging, dangling from a twig in the winter, though if you look very closely, maybe you can find it. Um, and then the, the moths are, are really only around for a couple days when they're reproducing. So they hatch from their cocoons or close from their cocoons in late spring. And then they, the females will stay in place and the males will use pheromones to find the female with their antennae um, and will fly up to a couple miles um, in, order, in order to find the female. And, and they fly at night, so they're not around during the day. That's another reason you don't see them. They actually don't feed while they're adults either, so they're not technically pollinators, but they're still important parts of the food web because the caterpillars are um, eaten by birds and paras uh, parasitic wasps and, and things like that. Um, and so they lay their eggs on their host plants. They rely on specific native host plants 
And that's, you know, if they don't have those host plants, they don't have the habitat to reproduce and uh, feed their caterpillars. The caterpillars eat, you know, the host plants like cherries and several other species, and then they pupate and form their cocoons by late summer and over winter in the trees like that. Now, other species that are related to the cecropia, like the luna moth, you may know the luna moth, um, that actually its caterpillars drop down from the trees and then it spins its cocoon and it overwinters in the leaf litter, which is very, makes it very vulnerable, especially in our suburban areas where we often blow the leaf litter away. So um, the service berry is an understory tree in the same family as the cherry, and it has an edible fruit as well. And its fruits are very tasty. I'd say they're kind of like a bitter almond um, slash cherry slash plum, um, but they're really small. And oftentimes we don't get a chance to get those fruits because the birds have eaten them all, the squirrels have eaten them all. So they're highly coveted by wildlife. And I think that's okay. I'd rather have the wildlife get them. Um, it is a lot of work for us to get them and pit them and everything because they have very small pits. So um, I, I'd say the birds should just eat them. But this one is growing in kind of a, um, actually right down the street from me, I live in Portland, Maine. And um, it's at the corner of a very, um, heavily trafficked area on a sidewalk and it's doing really well. It's a very versatile plant that does well in some sun, but also can handle shade and it's optimal soil moisture is medium, but it can handle dry soils or drought and then also um, can handle some wetness in the soil. So it's a really versatile plant and a beautiful plant, amazing for wildlife. It's a harbinger of spring um, because it's one of the first uh, plants to bloom in spring and it's distinctive amongst other similar looking plants that bloom in early spring like cherries because it actually the blooms come out while the leaves are still unfurling instead of blooming on leafless trees or fully leafed out trees the leaves are kind of like folded in half and they're kind of coppery in color and fuzzy when they're first coming out with the white blossoms. So it's a really beautiful and distinctive and you can kind of spot it from afar along roadsides in early spring. Now in the understory of kind of sunny, medium moist soils, um, there's some really lovely plants that could work well that would help beat out some of the competition like running ground cell that makes a really amazing ground cover. In this picture, you just see its flowers, but it actually has um, ground hugging leaves and is most of the season um, in these kind of basil rosettes that knit together and form a, a really um, dense ground cover. And then the clustered mountain mint is um, one, one of many species of our mountain mints. We have a lot of different mountain mint species, but this one I think is probably the most fragrant and the most showy because it has these white leaves that look like kind of petals, but they're actually leaves or bracts towards the upper surface when in flower. And um, then below they kind of get a deeper green and they're a little bit fuzzy and they smell incredible and they're attractive to tons of different species of bees and wasps. So they're just an incredible bee magnet um, and really important as a generalist species for bees. And then red columbine goes really nicely with these. It also would do well in kind of drier, rockier woodlands, um, but can handle full sun as long as there's enough soil moisture. So all three of these species work really nicely together. Um, red columbine moves around mainly by seeding in. So I like the idea of also combining plants that you know have maybe different kinds of growth um, habits. So some plants move uh, vegetatively by above ground stolons or um, rhizomes under the ground. Um, or some species, you know, will seed around and fill in blank spaces in the landscape. And those are all important. And it's nice to combine species like that seed with species that are vegetative spreaders, because then they have multiple, you have multiple ways for species to fill out space within a, an area and make sure that, you know, it's really competing well with the weeds in the area and also is um, resisting erosion 
and filling in all the different soil space. So running ground cell is also kind of a more of a vegetative spreader. It spreads by um, stolons and then and has runners above the ground. And then clustered mountain mint is something it'll kind of form a, you know, one um, colony that just slowly spreads out from the main colony. And we'll also seed around a little bit here and there too. Now we're into medium to wet. Um, so many of these species are found in pond edges, wetland edges, the edges of um, brooks and um, edges of wet forests. So they tolerate lots of sun and um, can handle wet feet most of the year. Now the swamp white oak is uh, one of my favorite species of oaks that I'd like to see used more in suburban and urban areas as a street tree because um, it's actually very adaptable to a wide range of conditions, even though it prefers medium to wet soils and full sun. So it's similar to um, the pin oak in what it prefers. So pin oak is um, Quercus palustris, and palustris refers to its preferred habitat in wetlands. And you'll often see pin oak um, along highway margins and in city you know, streets. And that's one of the most heavily used street trees, uh, native street trees. Um, and I think swamp white oak would make a nice alternative because pin oak, um, it has this really lovely form where the branches start out kind of pointing straight up at the top. And then as you get lower down on the stem, the branches go more horizontal. And then as you get to the bottom branches, they point almost down to the ground. And what happens with those is if they're on a, next to a sidewalk, people, the horticulturists end up having to prune those up in order to have them not, you know, slap people in the face. <laughs> so um, it's, it, it, you end up having to kind of disrupt the tree's natural form. So if you have a swamp white oak, uh, the branches generally are, you know, a little bit more normal branching than the pin oak. They don't have that form where the branches, the lower branches point down. So they're a really nice kind of potential alternative. Um, and they have incredible golden fall foliage. I think the oaks need to take a little bit more credit for their fall foliage, especially in Southern New England. I find the oaks and the hickories to be a really nice kind of later um, season fall color than the rest of the deciduous trees, like the maples and the poplars and the beeches and um, the ashes and the other hardwoods. Um, I think it's really important to to extend that season. Um, and it in during the growing season when it's not in its fall color, it will have a little bit more of a white fuzzy underside to the leaf and then a green um, above side to the leaf. So when the wind blows them, they kind of flash green and white and they're extremely beautiful trees. Some understory trees that re work really well in wetter saturated soils are the sweet bay magnolia, now this one will also grow in medium average soils and same with the winterberry holly. Um, the sweet Mag bay magnolia is a lovely um, understory tree and it is it has this really interesting form where the, the branches come out in kind of this tiered structure and it has like an open branching structure and um, pretty showy big white flowers that attract all sorts of pollinators too. It's a species that would thrive in Southern New England at this point, but we included it in our native trees um, book because we wanted to include species that were from a little farther south that grow in New England happily because we do see that uh, the need to consider some more Southern species for our Northern climates eventually especially as climate change is really impacting the plant hardiness zones and changing them quite dramatically. Um, I think sweet bay magnolia is, you know, going to be something that you'll see, you'll be able to use in Maine um, in the next, you know, 10, 20 years, uh, um, more and more. And I think the main thing, the main reason you wouldn't want to use it too far north is that at this point is that um, with a heavy snow, the branches can break, they're more brittle, um, but you already see that our winters are um, not always consistent. Sometimes we still do get heavy snows, but more of the time we get 
um, less and less snow and more and more rain. And when we do get snow, it doesn't last very long. Now the winterberry holly, I think many of us know this one, it's widely cultivated. So a lot of people do use it, uh, whether they're native plant people or not in their gardens because it has this beautiful red berry. Um, and this is an important one for the non-migrating birds that stay here throughout the season. Now, I think it's important to think about cultivars and using cultivars very sparingly. So most of us probably have seen the cultivar of winterberry holly. There's many different cultivars actually. A lot of them are bred for different color fruits, different size fruits or fruits that persist through the winter and don't get eaten by animals. And so I would stick to the natural species when possible, just because um, you're more likely going to have that be nutritious and interesting for wildlife. And it's going to have um, more uh, genetic diversity within the, you know, the, the species that are being sold if it's grown from seed rather than being cloned as a cultivar. Um, so this plant is, is really important to get the natural species of, but do keep in mind that it, it, there are male and female plants. So just like um, other hollies, um, the berries actually only show up on the female plants and the male plants are important for crop work for pollination of the female plants. So you do need some male plants around for heavier fruit set, but um, you're not going to get that berry, those berries on the male plants if you plant those. And then here's a really lovely kind of guild for a, a boggy area, or I could see this working really well as a container garden. So um, the Labrador tea is a really nice small shrub um, and it has, it's in the, it's in the Heath family and a lot of Heath family plants do really well in more acidic soil. So the bog inspired guild is meant for um, those air, wet areas with more acidic soil. So White turtle head can grow actually in a wide range of pHs, um, but the large cranberry is really specific to acidic and wet soils. And it's a nice ground cover that knits around other species. The purple pitcher plant is a carnivorous plant that some of you might know of, um, really great for acidic bogs because it you know, supplements its nutrition that it doesn't get from the soil. Um, because in acidic soils, the nitrogen is often less available to plants. So it supplements that with by digesting the bodies of insects and its cup-shaped leaves or pitcher-shaped leaves. It's really fascinating. And then the marsh marigold is a really lovely early blooming plant that um, seeds around primarily as its main mode of transportation and has the sunny yellow blossoms important for early early season pollinators um, and for lifting our spirits in early spring. I'm looking forward to seeing some of those along with the skunk cabbages that should be starting to bloom anytime. And cardinal flower is a biennial, biennial species that seeds around prolifically when it's happy and will grow not just in acidic soils, but in, in um, river floodplains as well and is important for hummingbirds as a pollinator. Here's an illustrated guild for a wet sunny spot. Um, blue iris and sensitive fern are both very vigorous plants that I think need to be paired together um, because they will both take up space in different ways. The blue iris is the taller one that will um, spread by rhizomes. And then the sensitive fern also spreads by underground rhizomes but is a little bit shorter than the blue iris. Heart-leafed alexanders, um, are really great for early season pollinators with their carrot family umbels of yellow flowers and beautiful glossy heart-shaped leaves. They also grow well in medium to dry soils too, so they're not just a plant for wet soils. Now we're getting into the next condition, which is part to full shade and medium to dry soil. So this can be one of the hardest niches to fill because I know many of us are always on the lookout for what's going to grow under an evergreen uh, where the soil is really dry and acidic or what's going to grow in the deep shade um, on the north side of a building or under 
um, conifers or deciduous trees. Um, so this is kind of a, a tricky one, but there are a lot of species that work well in this condition. So the shagbark hickory is one of my favorites. It'll do well in average garden soils too, but um, I think it's really distinctive in the landscape because of its shaggy bark that looks really cool even in winter right now. And like I said before, um, it has this golden, really beautiful golden fall foliage that blooms later than, I mean, sorry, not blooms, but goes, um, that um, goes by later than the other um, fall foliage uh, of other deciduous trees. So um, it kind of extends the season that way for seasonal interest. And this um, lovely picture of a basket of shagbark hickory nuts shows, you know, it's really um, great as an edible species for wildlife, but also for us. It's very nutritious and tasty, similar tasting to walnuts um, and can be used in a similar way to walnuts in any recipe. And I encourage you all to take a look at um, Russ Cohen's um, Wild Plants I Have Known and Eaten book. Um, you can find that if you just Google it, Russ Cohen's Wild Plants I Have Known and Eaten. It's a fabulous book that gives recipes for wild edibles and talks about how to harvest them, the best time of year to harvest them. And he's really good at paying attention to the ecological consequences of wild harvesting. So, you know, whenever you do harvest um, a wild plant, you want to be extremely vigilant about a number of things like, um, you know, whose property is it on? Do you have permission to collect? Is it near a polluted area? Is it safe to collect? Um, are you ethically harvesting and not taking too much of the plant? Are you leaving enough for uh, wildlife? And um, isn't it abundant enough plant? Um, I wouldn't recommend um, harvesting from any rare species or slow growing species, even plants like wild leek that aren't necessarily rare, they're slow growing and they are in danger of being over collected in the wild. And so many of the, these plants you can grow in your own gardens too. So why not grow your own so that you can collect from those instead of wild plants? Um, in part shade to full shade, I also find that there are not a ton of different shrubs that do really well and, and um, grow to their full form and flower and fruit prolifically. So finding something that works well in this condition is really important. So the maple leaf viburnum um, is a great plant for shade and will do well in moist or medium um, soils as well, but can handle drought. So I really like to point out here, it's fall color is incredible. And then it has berries that um, form in the late summer into fall and will hang on for a little while feeding lots of different wildlife. Now it can be easily um, mixed up with another species that looks a lot like it, the viburnum opulus, which is the cranberry bush. But the difference is um, are in, you can sort of tell from the leaves that they're a little bit different though their leaves look very similar. They're both maple shaped and opposite. So they come out in pairs, but the cranberry bush tends to have, I notice a little bit more rounded lobes on its leaves. And then its berries are actually red. So making sense for the the name cranberry bush um, or high bush cranberry, um, that, that would be another way to distinguish it from the maple leaf viburnum, which has dark blue berries. Now here's a really nice example of what a forested, uh, intentionally planted um, woodland in dry shade could look like in the month of June. I think, um, in woodland gardens or shady gardens, oftentimes we have the most blooming happening in the spring, as both in the trees and on the forest floor. And then you get a lull, um, sometimes right after that in late May into June. And you'll sometimes have things kind of blooming the rest of the season until we get our fall foliage, but it can be very quiet and more about textures than colors um, for the middle part of the growing season for a woodland garden. So I really encourage you to think about of having a variety of leaf textures and, and glossiness and 
shape and size so that you can have um, some interest throughout the whole season. And a great way to do that is to add something like Christmas fern, which has a slightly more glossy foliage by the time it it reaches midsummer and is a little bit more finely dissected than a lot of other species. Um, and mixing that with a broader leafed plant like the umbrella leaf, it is a bit more of a Southern species. So some of you Southern folks might know it more than the Northern folks, um, but will grow in Southern New England. And it has a broad leaf and I think could replace um, hostas really nice and nicely and provide a, a good alternative to those. Um, and it does have a really interesting fruit and flower. So it has little white fruits on these umbels. And um, by the time they turn to a fruit, they actually, uh, sorry, nice flowers on these umbels. And by the time they turn to a fruit, they the fruits are kind of a, a, a cobalt blue. And then the stems that attach to the fruit are red. So they're really funky looking plants and really interesting um, in the woodland garden. Now, black cohosh is uh, something that will bloom. You'll get a lot of white blooms in the middle of the season in um, woodland gardens, but black cohosh has this gorgeous candelabra-like flower, and I think it works really well in uh, larger drifts or masses because you get lots of these flowers together. And though the flower doesn't smell very nice, it does attract tons and tons of um, insect species. And it has kind of a whole food web on it unto itself. So I really love visiting the Natural Web um, blog by Marianne Borsch because she has incredible photos of um, many native species and of the insects that are um, intertwined and associated with these species that she observes. So in her blog post on Black Koha, she talks about all the bees and flies and beetles and um, butterflies that crawl around on the flowers and pollinate them and collect nectar and, and um, pollen. And then there's also this Appalachian azure butterfly, which is um, uses the black cohosh as its host plant. So its caterpillars crawl along the leaves and then the um, flower buds and eat them. And then it secretes a honeydew or poop. <laughs> and um, then ants actually in turn eat that honeydew and then protect the plant from other herbivores. So it's a really cool um, kind of um, symbiotic relationship that's happening here. And ants do this actually on a number of other species. They also do this with partridge pea and then, you know, on many of our milkweeds that get aphids, ants are farming those aphids, collecting their honeydew. And um, so when, when you see aphids on a plant, it doesn't mean the plant's going to die. When you see a um, another insect on a plant before you, you know, automatically assume it's a pest, it could be a beneficial insect and you might not even realize it. So inspect it more and learn about it and find out what its life cycle is and what it requires to keep reproducing. On the ground layer in part to full shade, these uh, ground cover species would work really well together. The Pennsylvania sedge is um, highly used as a lawn alternative these days um, because it doesn't need to be mowed or watered um, once established and is very you know, happy in shady, dry um, soils with very little fertility. So you don't really need to fertilize it either. Um, blue stem goldenrod is also happy in dry shade and Bauman's root is happy in kind of average soil to, to dry shade. Um, if it gets a little bit more sun, it needs consistent moisture. I've seen it kind of burn out if it um, is in too much sun and not enough, it doesn't have enough moisture in the soil, but in the shade, it can handle dry conditions. Um, and, you know, that blooms uh, earlier in the season and like late spring. And then blue stem goldenrod is a late season uh, bloomer. And I, I think it's important to include goldenrods and asters in our plantings as much as possible, just as much as um, those top keystone trees, because uh, goldenrods and asters are also considered uh, keystone plants. They support also um, over a hundred species of moth and butter moths and butterflies um, whose caterpillars forage on their leaves. And then later in the season when they're blooming, 
they support um, late season pollinators like bees and wasps and are really important for giving them that energy so that they can hibernate through the winter or end up, you know, um, dying back over the winter. The broadleaf sedge provides a nice contrast or um, focal point um, when, you know, mixed into some of these other species, especially the finer foliage of the Pennsylvania sedge. Um, and I think using sedges as ground covers and underneath taller plants is a really great way to go. Uh, Claudia West and Thomas Rainier talk a lot about this in their book, Planting in a Post Wild World. So I encourage you all to read that as well. Now in shady spots um, or sunny spots, I have this in the category of part to full shade, but they can also do really well in sunny areas. And I have it in um, medium to um, dry soils, but they, these species can also do well in, in wetter soils, everything except for the Pennsylvania sedge. But thinking specifically about acidic soils, there are certain species that are just adapted for acidic soils and they'll thrive there because they have less competition from other species. And a lot of times these are slightly slower growing species. Um, a lot of them in, are in the heath family, like the wintergreen or low bush blueberry. Um, but the both the all the Canada Mayflower, the um, bunchberry, and the wintergreen all grow in sun or shade in um, dry or even wet soils, but they really require just acidic soils. So um, they all these species would do really well underneath conifers um, where it could be very dry and also the soil very acidic. And that's actually a really tough. Um, niche to fill as well. I find a lot of people ask about, you know, what's going to grow under my pine tree or what's going to grow in the, the deep shade of a hemlock. And these are some of the species that will do that. In part to full shade, medium moisture, you have a little bit more flexibility. And I would say plants, things that, you know, would grow under um, deciduous trees where the leaves fall and they're able to fall and collect and, and build rich organic soil over time. So many of these species require medium moist soil with, um, that don't, you know, doesn't dry out during the growing season, um, that stays moist, you know, from spring to fall. And some of these species can handle a little bit more sun, but will thrive in shade as well. So basswood is another canopy tree that is actually very shade tolerant and um, it has these broad leaves. And I think a lot of times shade, shade plants have broad leaves because their leaves are adapted to kind of collect as much um, solar energy as possible. So they're like large solar panels that collect the sun. They, I think if you've ever you know, been introduced to a basswood or American linden, you'll, you'll know their distinctive heart-shaped leaves that are kind of asymmetrical. One of the bumps of the heart goes a little higher than the other. And they're actually incredible pollinator plants. Um, there's actually whole honeys that are marketed as linden honeys and are supposed to be extremely tasty. Um, and then, you know, butterflies and other species really love them because of the high nectar content of the flowers. This plant is a really great um, plant for um, creating deep organic matter in the soil. And because its leaves, you know, its roots actually are very deep and they pull up nutrients from deep in the soil. And then it deposits um, those nutrients on top of the, of the soil when its leaves die back in the, in the fall. And then that accumulates over time. So this is a really great plant for um, a lot if you do allow the leaves to stay put for enriching the soil over time. And of course, if you're allowing those leaves to stay put, you're supporting the life cycles of a number of different creatures like potentially um, salamanders and uh, bees and butterflies and moths that spend part of their life cycles in the leaf litter, frogs. These species are especially great in moist, rich woodlands. Um, the pagoda dogwood is called that because it resembles a 
Japanese pagoda in its tiered branching structure. It's really distinctive that way. And it's probably, I think it's our only dogwood that has alternate leaves that, where the leaves don't come out in pairs um, and the branches don't come out in pairs. Um, but it has a, a typical dogwood like flower, not the kusa or the flowering dogwood, but they have um, kind of um, frothy flat topped flowers, much like the um, red twig dogwood. And then they have these dark blue berries that are attractive to tons of squirrels and other wildlife and birds as well. Um, I actually think it used to be the main food source for the passenger pigeon before it went extinct. And then flowering raspberry is a true raspberry that doesn't have prickles on it. So it's nice and soft to the touch and it has these large showy flowers that do give way to um, that edible berries that they're not quite as juicy as blackberries or um, red raspberries, but they are still very tasty. They look a lot like red raspberries. And then the flowers are just extremely, um, in, you know, they're, there's bees all over them and buzzing around when, when they're flowering and they flower for quite a long time. Now flowering raspberry, I see often in its natural habitat growing along um, moist shady slopes with a little bit of a, um, a seep coming through. So there's a lot of nutrients in the soil and there's a lot of moisture in the soil, but I've also grown it in full sun. And I do find that in full sun, it can be a little bit more aggressive. So that's something that's good to keep in mind. Now, these three species work really well um, in the understory of the other species I just talked about. Um, and they're all somewhat versatile as well. The cranes bill geranium, the um, foam flower and aster, as well as zigzag goldenrod pair nicely together because you have the early spring blooms of the foam flower, the kind of mid to late spring blooms of the cranes bill geranium, and then the fall blooms of the bluewood aster and zigzag goldenrod together. And zigzag goldenrod is especially one that you'll find in uh, rich, wet, uh, moist soils and can handle a little bit more, more soil moisture than say the um, blue stem goldenrod or the wreath goldenrod. So um, it also has flowers that bloom in the little axles between the, the leaves and the stem. And more, these are more garden worthy asters and goldenrods for um, shade gardens and to attract tons of wildlife to your garden. The foam flower makes a really perfect kind of ground cover that really hugs the ground and, and forms a quilted pattern on the ground. And its leaves actually um, have quite a lot of variety in them. You'll get leaves that have deep dark modeling, more chartreuse leaves that are just pure light green and um, more maple shaped leaves, oaky shaped leaves. Um, so, you know, and everything in between. So it's a really beautiful plant to have even when it's not in flower. Here's a guild that works really well in moist rich woodlands. Um, you have the bluewood aster in the um, understory with the foam flower. Long beech fern is a fern that is very nice and um, well behaved. So it doesn't spread out as quickly as a lot of other ferns do. So it's actually, you know, nice to pair with more delicate woodland wildflowers like trilliums and uh, Virginia bluebells and other species that um, come up earlier in the season or some ephemerals like squirrel corn and Dutchman's breeches um, or trout lily. So that it, it kind of is only unfurling at that time when the ephemerals are up, but then kind of fills out that space later in the season once those ephemerals and early spring wildflowers have gone by. And the woodland phlox is another one to add to this mix. Um, it uh, is fragrant and it's another one that you can kind of pair with the creeping phlox and foam flower and makes a classic combination that you've seen kind of represented at Longwood Gardens and um, Garden in the Woods. And it's just extremely gorgeous when planted en masse with, as a combination. Now, I think we're at our last and final um, condition. So I'd like to talk about, you know, um, the wet shade and what will grow there. 
So you have a lot of the same species as the sun, sunny wet areas, because a lot of these species that grow in wet areas are tolerant of both shade and, um, and sun. And I really like the three of these species. Um, American holly is a species that, um, like other hollies, has male and female trees. So you want to plant the females to get more berries, but you do want to make sure that there's a male in the area so that you have good fruit set. But it's um, fruits last through the winter, important for many of the non-migrating birds. And it's evergreen. So that's really important, too, to think about. Now it grows in wet sites, but also grows in, in very dry shady sites and in full sun. So it can kind of do anything you want. Same with red maple, it's extremely versatile and will grow in um, uplands, but is most commonly found along red maple swamps, which is one of the most common types of wetlands we have in New England. And of course we know it's fall color. It's named red maple because at any point during the season, it has something red, whether it be the, the leaf buds, the flowers, um, the stems, or the fall foliage, there's something red on it at all times. And sweet pepper bush is a very versatile plant that will also grow in wet soils to dry as well as sun to full shade um, and is fragrant. So will support tons of different pollinators um, during the middle of the growing season. And I, I've actually, you know, rode my bike through wetlands in the middle of the summer when it's blooming in, say, July, and just have smelled the sweet pepper bush without even um, seeing it anywhere because it wafts throughout when it's planted in a mass or it grows in a mass in a wetland. Um, it just wafts throughout the whole area. It's so divine. And these species are really great for the understory of those woody species. So cinnamon fern is called that because of the fertile frond that grows up like a cinnamon stick through the center of its vase-shaped fronds. And um, it's just an incredible tall big fern to have as a statement in any garden. Marsh marigold, like I mentioned before, is an early, early bloomer, which is really important to have for those early flies and other pollinators that are looking for something as soon as they start to emerge. And then blue lobelia, like red cardinal flower, is a biennial that will seed around and find um, any open soil. So it'll find any wet open soil or moist open soil and seed into it. And so it's one of those plants that you can put in one spot and then you'll find it in all these other spots in the garden, which I personally like. I know that if you are um, somebody who um, you know, are, are, is just learning about native plants, it can be a little bit tricky to deal with the plants that seed around. So yeah, maybe I'd start with um, some of the plants that are a little bit more well known to me or the plants that stay in place if I'm new to gardening with native plants. But once you start to get to know them, you can find their seedlings really easily and be able to identify them or better yet grow them from seed yourself. And they say to know it is to grow it. Um, so that means that you'll really get to see what the plant looks like from seedling to full mature plant if you grow your own plants from seed. Thank you. Um, I know I see there's a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm happy to stay on a little beyond 1.30 since I know it's a little after 1.30 now and answer as many questions as you have. Um, and I am happy also to send this PDF to um, all of you via Mary Ellen um, in order to um, make sure that you have all the resources from it. Here's a sneak peek at the ground cover guide that's coming out this spring. And I really encourage you to, to take a look at it. Our members actually will get um, their own copy mailed to them straight from the publisher this spring when it's ready. So if you're not already a member, this is one great reason to become one along with all the other member benefits. But um, you know, if you're not a member and are not up for joining as a member, you, it'll also be available on our website um, come late April, early May. So. Anna, quickly tell us what the website address is. There are a few people that had questions about that. Yes, here it is on the bottom of this slide. It's wildseedproject.net. Pretty easy to remember. 
Fantastic. Well, we do have quite a few questions here and I'd like to get started. For those people who are with us and need to go, uh, of course, this will be recorded and you will be receiving a link. Uh, but I anticipate a good 15 minutes or so of, of Q&A here. So let's get started. First question was about the three brothers uh, planting and are they deer resistant? The three brothers. Um, I wouldn't ever say that any plant is necessarily deer resistant because um, I would just expect that deer will eat almost anything you plant if they're hungry enough. I've seen deer eat American holly, which has sharp leaves and um, rhododendrons during the winter. Um, but I would say, let's see, corn, beans, and squash. I would say they're they're probably all deer friendly plants. A lot of our edible species are, are, you know, really sought off after by rodents as well as um, woodchucks and deer. So, and I would definitely be careful and, you know, fence those in if you're hoping for a uh, high productivity from those species. And I just stopped my screen share if that helps um, so that we can see each other. But if you like, I can share my screen again so everybody can see it. Actually. We love, we love seeing you, so this is perfect. Thank you so much. Um, since we're on webinar, we won't be able to see people, but I encourage people to continue popping questions in. So the next question, a uh, lot of love for the beach plum. Um, one question was about black rot. Mm -hmm. one of, in any suggestions for managing black rot? Their beach plum got crushed by black rot. Yeah, so I'm not as familiar with that, um, but I would say that in general, when you're when you're wanting your plants to be really happy and healthy, just try to make sure that they have the optimal conditions. So that's why I suggested at the very beginning, you know, try to find the right plant for the right place. So learn about your site conditions and then pair the plant accordingly. So beach plum really requires full sun and well-drained soils in order to be happy. Um, and if there's something go on, going on with it, a disease or a pest, it could be in part due to um, not being, being a little bit stressed from being in the wrong conditions. So if it's in too wet of an area, it will not do very well. But um, I would visit your university, local university extension to learn more about specific diseases and pests since I'm not an expert in that area. Terrific. And of course, we have the Yukon Master Gardener program, which is open and free for people to connect to and ask those types of questions. So another question, a lot of discussion about dioecious plants here and bayberry being one. Yes. And one of the first questions is the challenge of really being able to identify even nurseries struggle with, you know, female male plants. Yeah. What, what might you help us with here in terms of um, helping to ID those? Yeah, that's always a little bit of a tricky thing to do when buying a plant from a nursery because sometimes it takes uh, several years for the plant to mature and start producing a lot of flowers and fruits. And so you won't necessarily know um, until there's actually a flower present and you can, sometimes you need a, a hand lens to look at the flower and be able to identify the male and female parts and having a botanist on hand can be help for, helpful for that. The nursery people are often very good with that, but often don't have the expertise for that either. So um, I think it's a little tricky. With bayberry, uh, I think people mostly don't grow those specifically for the berries. So what I would do is just make sure you get several individuals. In general, when you're buying a plant, I like to get at least three of something because partly so that you have backup if one something happens to one. Um, you also, if it's a plant that is dioecious, which means that it's flowers and fruits, it's male flowers and male fruits are on, uh, or sorry, male, male plants are separate than female plants. So that means that the female plants have female flowers and then produce the fruits, whereas the male plants do have flowers on them, but they're male flowers and then they don't produce the fruits. So you need the male plant and the female plant in the same proximity within about a mile apart or so in order to have fruit on the female plants. Um, and so a lot of species are like that. Winterberry holly, all, all hollies are like that. Um, bayberry as well, as well as pawpaws too. So that's good to keep in mind, especially because people grow those for fruits. Um, 
So I would say get more than one at the nursery. Maybe if you can try to find a slightly older plant, like the one that's a couple years old, but I still think it's great to buy plants that are small so that they're more able to adapt, their roots are more able to adapt to the soil when they're planted. Um, and if they're in fruit or flower when you get them, that's a good time to try to uh, sex them. So I know at Garden in the Woods where I used to work, they would do their best to sex the plants whenever it was possible to, and they'd mark the female plants with like a, a ribbon or something like that. So I would ask your local nursery person if they are able to do that. Um, and then otherwise, I know it can be very tricky to do. So those are my suggestions. Thank you, Anna. And right. about bayberry, is it harmful to eat? And people were thinking specifically about children here. I don't think um, bayberry is poisonous. So if a child took a sample of it, I think they'd be okay. Um, you don't want to eat a huge quantity of it, though. I don't think um, it's poisonous, but you just, you know, with any plant that there's not a whole lot of research on, you need to, you know, practice caution. But um, it is something that is made into a tea, so it has a degree of edibility, and I, I don't think it's something to worry about with kids. I would worry about plants um, like black cohosh or baneberries, which are related to cohosh, um, since those plants are poisonous. They're in the tomato family, and tomato plants are poisonous. The plants themselves, if eaten, they're poisonous, but the fruits of tomatoes are not poisonous. So even our most um, highly cultivated vegetables uh, have are often poisonous. So keep that in mind um, that, you know, teach your kids to be very vigilant and not to eat plants if possible. Often very young kids will eat anything. So maybe stay away from those plants when you have young children or, or pets. Thank you. A question about how, how do you manage deer and rabbit browsing? <laughs> I dealt with this a lot when I was a horticulturist at Garden in the Woods. We had a healthy deer population in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, we did have a deer fence there, so we were lucky enough to get that put in, but there were some weak spots in the fence where it crossed some um, brooks. So that can be tricky because sometimes even with the deer fence, sometimes you end up trapping deer in or they reproduce inside the fence or they get in somehow. So if you have the ability to put in a deer fence that's at least eight feet tall, that's ideal, though I know that's not something that most of us can do financially or otherwise. So um, another way that I deer, deal with deer is to use um, repellents and the repellents that I use are non-toxic. They are really just using natural materials that smell really bad that, you know, repel the deer and make them not want to eat foliage. So a couple different brands that I like are um, Bob X, like a Bobcat, but Bob X. Um, and that one, I do, do think it does have some, um, usually they have a predator urine in them as well. So that can be another thing that repels deer, but it also has pungent, you know, things like garlic and onions in it. And it all just makes it smell really bad. So you need to spray it on your plant on a non-windy day <laughs> and keep yourself, maybe to have a different change of clothes to use. And uh, spraying it on your plant, especially in the spring when the plants are in rapid growth, um, regularly is a good idea because um, that's actually also when they're the most palatable to deer. Otherwise, you can also fence in individual plants. So whenever you're planting a tree or a shrub, I definitely recommend for new plantings to um, fence them in with something like hardware cloth. Um, that will protect them from both rodents and deer. So thank you. Um, and another question here around the sunchoke. A comment mm -hmm. was made that although they're beautiful, this particular person is finding that they're very aggressive and labor intense, intensive yeah. to remove them when they grow into areas that you didn't expect them to show up. What thank you, that's a really have? good point. Um, sorry, what was that last bit? What, what advice would you have um, mm -hmm. in this case? Oh yeah, I meant I meant to mention that that guild, the three brothers, um, should really be planted in a container 
or if you have a place, a site that has a, a broad expansive area for to accommodate them, but they're not for a small garden. So wild strawberry, Jerusalem artichoke and um, American ground nut are all vigorous species. So um, Jerusalem artichoke, I would put in a container like you could find a really big fun container like a whiskey barrel or something like that, or um, it doesn't even have to be that big. It could just be a large, you know, foot by foot container of some sort. Um, and you could also sink that container into the ground a little bit so that it looks like it's planted into the ground. That's a cheap kind of way that I've done it before. Um, as long as you're just watching it to make sure nothing hops the container into the ground. And um, especially with American ground nut, I find that in, in moist, sunny spots, it can sort of take over taller um, plants by trellising up them and kind of weighing them down, and then it'll spread out in an area. Um, now I've seen it um, in its natural habitat growing in really thick patches like that, and it's great because it adds um, a lot of a lot more diversity into an area by, you know, filling all those little niches in the landscape and growing over other things. But in a kind of ornamental garden, that might not be very <laughs> ideal. So I would definitely put that one in a container as well. Um, if And it's great for a small site too, if you have a container like that that can handle really nice, big, aggressive plants, but, um, you know, they're contained that way. So, um, Wild strawberry can go in some smaller gardens. It's not the only one. I mean, it's not it's not only able to do well in big areas, but do know that it is um, vigorous and will kind of start filling out all the spaces on the ground underneath your plant. So if you wanted other ground covers there as well, you might want to not just choose wild strawberry. You might want to choose some other vigorous ground covers to kind of um, battle it out. And and a question while we're talking about aggressive plants, the partridge pea, is that very aggressive? And do the deer tend to favor partridge pea? That one is not, I would not consider partridge pea aggressive. I think it might appear that way in the first year or two of a planting because it's annual. So annuals, um, the reason, you know, the way that they move themselves around is by seeding in everywhere and biennials as well. Um, they reproduce and get themselves out into the world by producing tons of seed. And so um, partridge pea will, the individual plant will only persist that single growing season and then it'll die back, but its seed pods will produce more seeds that seed into the landscape for future years. So I like, that's why I like to use it for a newly establishing garden or a, it, an area that I know is going to be mostly blank for a while while I you know, maybe grow the plants or, um, you know, figure out what I'm going to plant there. So um, it's great for like filling in a space one season before you have things to add in. But once the longer lived perennials and grasses start to really take up that space, the partridge pea will disappear. You might see it popping up on the edges or in a blank spot every now and then. Um, but I notice after about three or four years, it's mostly gone. And it's, I have seen deer browse it a little bit, but I don't think it's something that's preferred by deer it, from my experience. So deer are like individual people. I noticed that, you know, in one spot, they really like one plant and in another area, they might like another type of plant. So um, they all, they have a different, you know, edible palette as well, like us. So which of the shrubs and small trees can be grown successfully in containers was another question we have here. Um, many different shrubs um, can be grown in small containers. With trees, I would steer clear of anything that has a taproot like the oaks, um, but many other many species can be planted in, in containers. I think beech plums, maybe stick with the smaller trees just so their root systems don't get too confined by the container. Um, 
So, you know, I, I think one that I've seen really nicely planted in a container is the aromatic sumac, that one, or fragrant sumac is another name for it. Um, that one has been growing in, in a container at our founder, Heather McCargo's house for a number of years, and it looks really beautiful. She puts the container in a little corner where there isn't enough space in the bed for a planting of a shrub like that, but within a container, um, she can stage it there temporarily or um, put it there for one growing season and then plant it into the ground once she finds a spot for it. So it's mm -hmm. a really great one for that. Um, other trees and shrubs that I think would do well in a container are you know, shrubs that would fill out space like the bush honeysuckle. That's another nice ground cover and it does grow up to four feet, but um, in poor drier soils, it'll grow a little shorter and it'll really fill out a container nicely. I also really like um, bearberry in a container that's uh, also known as kinnick or Arctostaphylus uva ursi. And that one will trail over a the lip of a container and look really beautiful, planted with a few other things in there. Um, but keep in mind that one requires really um, well-drained soil. So you don't wanna overwater it. And um, in general with containerized plants, you just wanna make sure that they don't dry out too much, but they don't stay wet too long. And that's the, one of the main tricks for growing plants in containers, because it is a different environment than growing in the ground. So you have to pay a lot more attention to their water requirements um, over the course of the growing season. So another question about um, growing in a preferred situation of something, Pacera was one of the questions here that in their experience been in, it could be an aggressive um, cedar and if used in a less preferred situation would that be less problematic yeah i think that's a, a good way to think of it um so pacra is a, is a plant that will seed around a little bit in order to kind of move itself around um the area but for the most part i see it as a um stoloniferous plant that spreads itself vegetatively mostly. It does produce a lot of seeds. Another thing you can do is um, after it finishes, just as the flowers are finishing up, you can cut them back and don't let it go to seed. Um, and that will actually sometimes spur another um, flowering period, which is really nice. Um, but you can also, like mentioned, um, you can put it in a slightly drier, shadier spot and it'll, it'll be less aggressive. Uh, another species I've seen that working well with is um, the northern sea oats or Tasmanthium latifolium. That one is in, in moist, sunny areas. It can be very aggressive and seed around a lot. But if it's in a dry, shady spot, which it's also tolerant of, it'll be a lot less aggressive, though you still have to kind of catch the seedlings as they come up um, here and there, but just not as much as in a sunny, moist spot. No, thank you. And a question about that Pacara with grazing sheep. And um, is, is this, is Pacara considered poisonous for hmm. grazing sheep? I'm not other, sure. Other I don't livestock. think so. My hunch is no, but I would definitely research that a little bit more because I just have never really thought about, you know, grazing animals with Pacara, but I assume it's not, but yeah, don't take my word for it. Cause I don't know for sure. <laughs> Um, another question about uh, cultivation here. Winter, um, one of our um, questions uh, is around winter berry, that it needs a male and female to produce berries. And they're thinking of planting the male and female in the same hole when it's very young. But that's been a strategy that's worked for her uh, because she has a smallish yard and she, she, does that make sense? Does that strategy make sense for winter berry in this case? Mm. Um, that is a little tricky. I have like, you know, with birches, uh, sometimes they're grown as multi-stem trees at the nursery by, they actually combine a couple seedlings and then they kind of graft together and grow as a multi-stem plant. So it, it has, it does work sometimes, but, um, and, and especially with your small property, I can understand why you'd want to do that, but I, I probably wouldn't do that. Um, maybe that is the case where sometimes a cultivar 
is um, the appropriate thing or just another species that's smaller. But um, if you want to grow winterberry in a much more uh, compact space, sometimes a dwarf cultivar is a good idea. But just keep in mind to look for a cultivar that um, compares well with the natural species. So the fruits are the same color, the same size, the flowers are the same color and size, and the leaf color hasn't changed either. It's not variegated or anything like that. That'll be more likely um, a plant that's still friendly to wildlife that might forage on it. Um, so I think one cultivar that might be a slightly better cultivar is winter uh, red rather than um, some of the other cultivars. And you can plant a small, a dwarf cu cultivar with it, like Southern Gentleman or in the vicinity, um, which will not have berries, but will not take up as much as much space as the natural species. You can sometimes manage ma natural species by just pruning for size management, but I find that to be a little bit of an uphill battle and it's best to just, um, you know, plant something that's appropriately sized for your area in the first place. Um, mm. And another thing with, with uh, holly is, or winterberry holly is that oftentimes you don't necessarily need to plant the male. Sometimes you can just plant the female and just see what happens. And um, there's, you know, it, there's more in, of those in cultivation than a, a lot of other species. And if you happen to live near a wetland, there's likely to be a winter berry holly in that wetland. But I find that oftentimes there's enough in the neighborhood that you might not actually need to plant the male. Thank you. And so you've led right into the next question about cultivars. Uh, I think you've answered this a little bit. What is your overall thinking on cultivars? Yeah, so I am not against cultivars altogether. Sometimes they serve a purpose, but um, like I just mentioned with winterberry holly, I think my main reason for using a cultivar might be if I need something that's dwarfed um, to fit in a compact space. Because I, I live in the city and I understand that it can be really hard to find appropriately sized plants for a small space. However, um, my stance on cultivars are that if you can use the natural species um, when possible, that's the best way to go because they are going to have the most, especially if you have a plant that's grown from seed, the most genetic diversity. Um, so that means that the next generation of that plant, a seedling that comes off of that plant will be genetically different from the original plant. And uh, the plant that you buy will be different from what was grown in the nursery. Um, what happens with most, with all cultivars is they're cloned in order to maintain the traits that they were bred for. Um, otherwise, if they are, you know, a seedling off of that cultivar, um, they're not necessarily going to have, you know, whatever traits that they were cultiv cultivated for, like larger flowers or double flowers or um, dwarfism or something like that. So... Mm -hmm. That's one of the main things to think about. Another thing with cultivars is that we just don't know enough about um, their wildlife value versus the natural species. And the studies that have been done have, a lot of them have shown that um, oftentimes cult the cultivars will have less nutritional content or be less palatable for um, wildlife than the natural species, whether that be in their leaves or fruits or flowers. Um, so some, you know, for instance, some phlox cultivars um, have maybe a higher nectar content in their flowers or bloom for longer, but maybe, but the, the nutrition in that nectar might be less than the natural species. So, you know, it's kind of like a, a um, pollinator eating, you know, candy versus eating really nutritious food. So those are my considerations. So I think if you ever feel like you're picking a cultivar, I would encourage you to consider, really think deeply about the reasons you're choosing it. Um, a lot of times people choose cultivars because it's just what's marketed to them. It's thought of as being you know, higher functioning in the landscape or um, more disease resistant or having bigger, longer lasting showier flowers or fruits. Um, and that's not always true. It's oftentimes the cultivars are marketed by the nursery industry to make us think that it's going to be a better plant if we buy the cultivar, the new shiny cultivar. 
So the natural species seed grown is always the best choice ecologically and it's still a great choice um, in terms of um, aesthetics too. Like the natural species sometimes in my mind can be more beautiful than the cultivar. Thank you. And so we have questions about the amelanchia and rust on the fruit. Uh, people are saying, you know, will it come back? It was bad last year, but mm. mostly the question circles around, will birds still eat the berries? Yeah, so the rust is not something that is going to kill the plant. I think if the plant was already weakened by a number of other diseases or pests, maybe the rust would be one more thing that could weaken it but it's not going to kill the plant. So that's good to keep in mind. Um, and the berries will still be great for wildlife as well as the flowers. So yeah, the rust isn't make or break. It comes from, it's kind of like cedar apple rust. There's rust for other rose family plants that are associated with cedars that need cedar as a host as well. They need two hosts. They need um, the cedar as well as the rose family plant. So there's the amelanchia apple rust too. And um, it's actually kind of cool looking on a cedar. <laughs> it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I know that it can kind of overtake the plant. And um, so, you know, if possible, if you're going to plant one species or the other, don't plant the other one in the same vicinity um, if you're concerned about cedar apple rust or another related rust. Well, I want to uh, let people know we're going to go about 10 more minutes with questions. Would that be okay, Anna? Yeah, that's fine with me. Thanks oh, for okay. hanging on longer, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few people are here and just wanted to do a shout out to Russ Cohen, who you uh, yeah. referred to a resource. He's actually with us today and uh, has put some really wonderful comments and that resource on edible plants, edible native plants in the chat. And so for the awesome. people who are interested in downloading the chat, at the bottom of your chat box, three little buttons. Um, you can click on that, it then hit show folder and you'll be able to actually save the chat. But we will go ahead and save that chat for you for the people who um, were having a hard time with that. So thank you. So another question, um, adding on to the repellent spray question, does it bother the insects that we're trying to attract? We were talking about the deer repellent um, concoctions you were talking about before. I don't think so. Um, I mean, I don't think there's been extensive studies on that. So it could be an interesting thing to do a research study on, but I don't think it has like a, a major effect on insects. I, the repellent doesn't stay on the leaves forever. It, over several weeks, it'll get washed off. And, and also during rap, times of rapid growth, um, the plant will grow out of it basically. And so they say to actually spray more frequently in the spring as plants are going through rapid growth because um, the plants won't keep the repellent on them very long. So yeah, and you can really target it to specific species like, at Garden in the Woods, the, the really coveted plants by deer were archiliums, so we always had to spray archiliums. And then any lily family plants, um, like the Solomon seal, the new shoots of Solomon seal, and they like asters a little bit too, but they'd usually nibble those back, not all the way down to the ground. And then the asters, of course, have time to keep growing in the growing season. So they'd be like pruned down for us and then they'd bloom on shorter stalks. Um, but yeah, I, I especially think those tender perennials in spring are really important to spray. And, and if you're not spraying everything, like you're not gonna be spraying all the leaves of all the deciduous trees. So for the most part, you're not gonna be making a huge impact on the ecosystem or the insects just by putting that deer repellent down. Thanks, Anna. So question about bladder bush. It's growing well for this person in a shaded zone four wood. Um, opinion on the species? Will you say the species again? Bladder bush. Bladder bush. Hmm, Which, I don't know that one. Um, there we go. So the person who typed <laughs> that in, if you're still there, tell us more. And if you have the Latin name that might help us. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So someone had a question about whether or not ground nut could be trellised, it's mm -hmm. growing all over her tall flocks. Mm. Yeah, so if it's already in a garden bed, it's gonna come up, it'll, it'll um, kind of grow in under the ground but from its rhizome and then it'll come up somewhere else. So you do wanna, you know, 
be careful to not plant it in a general garden bed where you want other things growing um, to look nice as well, because it's a hard one to remove all of because it'll grow by these thin underground runners attached to the chunky um, uh, tuber tubers, and then it will just pop up in a bunch of different spots. But if you put it in a container or if you have it in a confined space that's confined maybe by concrete or stone or something like that, um, then it will like less likely be a problem for the rest of your garden. And you can definitely grow it on a trellis. Um, and it's perennial, so it's not a woody vine. So it'll die back each year and you can kind of train it each spring to start growing along, along that trellis. Fantastic. Let's see. Beach plum roots, are they invasive or let's not use the word invasive, aggressive growing into pipes? No, definitely not. I wouldn't worry about beach plum roots. I might worry about something like a weeping willow or a black willow, but you probably wouldn't be planting. Well, hopefully you don't plant those plants near like um, your septic system or water pipes or anything like that because they're they will have deep and long roots that stretch for a long time and reach for water but i wouldn't worry about that which with beach plum thank you does the spotted cranes bill have giant roots like the bloody cranes bill oh um no the spotted cranes bill it'll have it has thick knobbly roots um and the excuse me, they're not huge. Um, they won't sprawl out too far either. So that's one that I wouldn't worry about too much. I noticed the roots are somewhat shallow. So when you're cutting them back in the fall or the spring, they, you can easily pull them up, um, which isn't great, but um, overall their roots are not huge and long. So going back to the bladder nut bush. Oh, bladder nut. Yes. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. that was what the person was looking for. Supposedly That's what I thought it might be. My grouse, American right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and sorry, what was the question with that one again? Well, now that isn't, that, isn't that a good thought? Um, <laughs> I had moved on from that. So I'll be back to that in a second. In the meantime, okay. let's talk about the viburnum cranberry. Person is wondering whether they can grow the viburnum cranberry in the sun with a somewhat wet environment. Yeah, I think that would work well for the high bush cranberry, a viburnum opulus. Um, and I would just, you know, source that one well, because even at Garden in the Woods, we were, uh, we had to take them out of, of being for sale, but we did get some of the European cranberry bush in um, that was mixed up. It's mixed up a lot of the times in the nursery industry with the native species. Um, and that can be really hard to tell apart even for a botanist. So um, try to get it just from a really good source, um, a, a really well-known um, nursery that you know that there are botanists on staff or just highly trained staff that can tell those species apart. Um, and a lot of the cranberry bush that's in Maine along the roadsides and everything is actually not the native species. It's actually the European species. So unfortunately, that's kind of been more widespread than the native. Um, but that one, yeah, will tolerate some more moist soils and full sun and grow. I see it growing a lot at the edges of a wetland um, in kind of part sun, full shade um, and the edges of roadsides. So let's see, question about ticks. Um, the person is saying, gee, sometimes people are hesitant to rewild because of ticks. Are there any plants you would suggest that would deter ticks? Right, so I, I think almost every time I give a webinar, um, I get the question about ticks. And I think it's a very good question because it does make you think, okay, so if I'm planting all these um, tall native species close to my house, I'm gonna have all this vegetation that I might brush up against and, and there will more likely be ticks in the landscape. And you might, I mean, there, it's yes and no, Where, will, they, will there be more ticks? I think there's a number of things to think about and you can kind of zoom out at the whole ecological scale in order to really think about this question. Um, so 
ticks are present and they're, you know, carry Lyme disease and there's more and more ticks with climate change because um, they, you know, they're moving farther north and as well with our habitat degradation, um, there's a lot more deer out in the world. And um, so that means there's a lot less predators of those deer. Um, and we, those deer populations are not in check. And there's a high correlation between tick populations and deer because tick, uh, deer are a carrier for ticks. So um, when deer don't have enough habitat, they're funneled to a lot of times our gardens and we'll eat our plants and carry ticks with them. And the white-footed mouse is another tick carrier as well. So I think in general, some things that we could do in our landscapes to help curb the tick population, though they'll always be with us, are to create more connected corridors of habitat for um, lots of different wildlife, but especially those predators like hawks and foxes and coyotes. Um, and other large predators that can eat mice and other rodents, as well as sometimes deer, though the wolf, our, the main deer predator, has been hunted out of New England, unfortunately. So in larger areas, I think deer hunting is a good way to control their populations where it's safe to do so. Um, and then I also just think, um, you know, one way that you can make sure to um, avoid your um, contact with tick, potential tick habitat is to, you know, if you have paths around your landscape, uh, make sure they're at least, you know, three to four feet wide so that you're not coming in contact with the vegetation every time you step outside your door. Um, and um, have a diversity of species and a lot of, I think, still having layers in the landscape is still really important. And creating that habitat will create um, places for, you know, other mammals that control ticks like possums. They eat ticks, really great mammals, um, and other species to kind of bring that in check. Also, removing invasive species will help um, keep deer populations a little bit lower. There's a correlation between invasive species like the Japanese barberry and ticks, probably because they can be can you know help hide um, white-footed mice which carry ticks um, within their barbed foliage and dense foliage so that's important to consider too um, and just do all your due diligence to protect yourself from ticks I wouldn't say that there's any particular native plants that deter ticks um, that I know of maybe there's somebody in the comments who knows um, of some species but not that I know of so um, yeah, it's look, taking a look at that kind of broader view and just increasing habitat and diversity um, in our biodiversity in our landscapes that will help control the tick population to some extent. Anna, thank you so much. We're gonna round this up with three more questions before we leave. Um, question about poison ivy and how to keep that at bay. What advice would you offer? Oh gosh, well, um, it, I think, it's a nice idea and more and more companies are, are coming out with um, having goats do some of our invasive um, species management as well as poison ivy, which is not considered an invasive species. It's a native species, but does happen to thrive in highly disturbed um, soils. So um, I think goats are a good option, especially if you're, you're doing a bigger undertaking where you're restoring a, a habitat or a site or um, are going to be planning on planting uh, natives in place of um, weedier species in an area. Um, and otherwise, poison ivy is really tricky. Um, I have personally done a lot of poison ivy control. Um, I You've got to if you're allergic to poison ivy, like I am highly allergic, you have to suit up and just be very careful. And uh, one, one um, mechanical control method that I've done is to take a big barrel out with a big plastic, black plastic bag in it, and then have another plastic bag that you put your arm into, pull the poison ivy out very carefully so it doesn't like throw back on you or um, anything like that and then place it into that barrel and just keep going that way and try to get as, as much of the runner up as possible and um and to just be very persistent with it 
Um, for a large area, I think goats are the way to go if you don't want to use chemicals. And I try to prefer not to use chemicals, <laughs> but it's a, it's a tricky one. Yes. And so back to the bladder nut uh, bush question, yeah. Chris was just really interested in uh, the idea it's growing easily uh, in, in, in the landscape um, for him or for her and just wanted to mention it. So really no big question there, just, just curious about your thought about the bladder nut bush. Right, so bladder nut, and it's a really beautiful plant. I love the kind of white striations on its bark. And then it has these really cool, it's called bladder nut because it has these like, these fruits that look like swollen bladders. They're three parted. Um, and it is a very vigorous suckering shrub and will grow in shade. So that's just something to keep in mind that it will form kind of thickets. And if you want um, to grow other things around it, you, I mean, it's harder to grow a lot of different um, plants around it because it will form, it will just sprawl out from underground stems. Um, so I'd put it in an area where you need to kind of take up space. But it's a lovely, it's a lovely plant. Yeah, and our last question today, before we move on to plant resources and handing it back to Mel, um, can you walk on the Carex Pennsylvanica? What about a dog running through it? I think there was some concern there. <laughs> yeah, so Pennsylvania sedge, it's a nice lawn alternative, mostly aesthetically, because it can't take um, moderate foot traffic and it can take light foot traffic. So, um, at Garden in the Woods, we have a Pennsylvania sedge lawn, and we would um, actually have a couple different events that would, we'd put picnic tables out on the lawn and have people walk across it a couple different times during the growing season. And it seemed to spring back after that, especially if we mowed it after that and let it regrow, though it doesn't need to be mowed, but I think just because it would get trampled, it would benefit from being mowed and, and let new fresh growth take its place. So um, it can handle a little bit of foot traffic, like a dot could run across it once in a while, but just not consistent all the time. If you really wanna have a turf alternative that you can you know, play soccer on um, or let the dog kind of run out onto all the time, I would actually do a fescue mix. And those are not all native fescues, but there's a variety of fescue species, which are grasses that can handle, um, drought and some part shade and don't grow too fast so they don't need to be mowed very very frequently or watered very often and you can get those mixes from various places but I've most recently seen it in the prairie moon or sorry the prairie nursery catalog uh, mm -hmm. for spring so they have a really nice fescue mix in there. So people are more interested in plant sources and lists and if they could find them in the books that you've shared. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to uh, hand this back over to Mel, who, of course, will talk to us about Aspatuck Land Trust's native plant sale, which, of course, we encourage people to come to to find all, many of these amazing um, resources. So, um, Anna, thank you so, so much. And I will hand this back over uh, to Mel and hang on here and there may be something else she'll ask of you and just want to thank you so much for uh, your being here today and for this incredible engagement by everybody online today with all of the chat going back and forth and just really grateful you're here today so thank you so much for staying with all these wonderful questions and for giving us so much just delightful information about about the guilds and the natives today so Mary Ellen welcome back. Thank you so much, Anna. That was amazing. I must have taken about six pages of notes um, from your lecture, and uh, it was so well received. And um, you know, you'll see the chat when we send it to you. But people just were uh, praising how well organized and clear it it was, and I think that's bit, you know that's the real pride that the native um, uh, that the Wild Seed Project should take is that you know you've made things so accessible for people and so. Um, I wouldn't say simple, but logical uh, to look at the landscape and try and replicate it using native plants. So that was just so wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, it, I, again, everyone, this will be recorded. If you've registered, we will send you the recording. We did have a question from a couple of folks. If you, um, Anna, if you would share your slides with people. Sure. Yes? Oh. Yeah. 
that would be great. Okay, so we will we will mention that and then have those people reach out to you directly if they want to um, get your mm -hmm. slides from you. So oh right, so, sorry, I'll share them after the presentation. <laughs> I don't know why I just shared it right now. So I encourage everybody to um, go to the Wild Seed Project um, website, become a member. I am and have been, and uh, I really look forward to the new book that's coming out. Um, and I also am um, thankful for people to come that came today. And I'd love for you to come to our Lunch and Learns more regularly. Um, if you want to go on our uh, aspatucklandtrust.org website um, and go onto our events, we list all of our Lunch and Learns coming up. And we encourage you to um, also become um, a member so that we can keep you in the loop of amazing lectures like Anna's. Um, next Tuesday, uh, next Lunch and Learn is um, Connecticut Audubon's own Charlie Stebbins is gonna be talking about the 36 acre Smith Richardson pre uh, preserve that uh, he and his team transformed from an overrun uh, 36 acres of the invasive species uh, to a bird and pollinator paradise. Um, and lots of elbow grease, lots of planting thousands of trees and shrubs. And he's gonna share with us um, how they did that uh, next Tuesday on our next Lunch and Learn. So um, thank you again, everybody uh, for joining the Aspatuck Land Trust and thanks to the Wild Seed Project for all of the great work they're doing. And especially for Anna, for her knowledge um, we all really enjoyed it today. This was just wonderful. Thank you so much.